The brown trout, the most studied fish in the world, favourite of fly fishermen and saviour of many an upland community in times of hunger. Also a cosmopolitan fish, at home in the cold waters of Iceland, across every country in Europe, in North Africa, Turkey, Lebanon, northern Iran and Central Asia, as far east as the Tian Shan Mountains and the Hindu Kush range of Afghanistan. This one is from the water of Dew here in the Glenkens. The brown trout also thrives as a popular immigrant out with its native range. Scottish brown trout are now naturalised in many other parts of the world, including North and South America, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Sri Lanka, India, and in the mountains of the old northwest frontier of Pakistan, a forgotten trout fishing region which the media insists on telling us is populated only by terrorists and madmen. This area is the subject of our story. In order to reach northwest Pakistan, Scottish trout from the Hawitoon hatchery were taken on a truly epic journey. Firstly as eggs in a sailing ship to Bombay and then up into the Nilgiri hills where they were successfully reared. When railway travel started, eggs were taken north to the tributaries of Indus in Kashmir and then over the years westwards by mule across the Himalayan passes as far as Gilgit and finally in the 1950s to the old princely state of Chitral on the Afghan border. Interestingly, they could just as well have been brought here from only 10 miles away in Afghanistan, where they're native, avoiding those thousands of miles of rail and sea journeys from Scotland. This option probably didn't occur to anyone, since in the days of the British Raj, their presence may not have been well known. Trout are sight hunters and need clear water, which in northern Pakistan is restricted mainly to a handful of small streams and lochs in the Hindu Kush, Hindu Raj and Karakoram Mountains. The first one I visited was in 1970 in Bomberet Valley, where a fast mountain stream runs down for about 20 miles from the Afghan border to the main Chitral River. In those days I only carried a spool of line and some hooks, so after walking 10 miles upstream through a dramatic gorge, I found a 10-foot willow branch for a rod, dug a few worms, and caught a beautiful 12-inch brown trout, which I spotted lying in a clear pool. My friend Ralph and I were then approached by a shepherd boy who milked a nearby goat and gave us a bowl to drink. It was the second day of Ramadan, the Muslim fasting month, but he was a member of the Kalash, the local pagan tribe, and was clearly delighted to share a drink with fellow unbelievers. An older boy then appeared and on seeing the trout became very excited and began talking about thousands of rupees. It seemed very strange that trout fishing should be regulated in this remote place. In nearby Afghanistan, where we were living at the time, trout fishing permits were unheard of. Not having thousands of rupees, we immediately took off several miles down the valley and turned off up into Rambur, the remotest of the three Kalash glens, where we had an unexpected reception from women in the first village we came to who came out and put garlands round our necks. I was back in Bombret a couple of years later and learned about those fishing regulations when I came across a Pathan gentleman, Matsi Babu, or Fish Babu, who issued me an old British-style permit complete with beat numbers and size limits for the grand price of five rupees. He spent the next two days walking over a major pass into Chitral village and back to deliver his five rupees to the government fisheries officer. I felt like I was the first person to have bought a fishing permit since the British left. At that time they had wooden idols in the fields, sacred groves and temples decorated with fresh drawings of Mahor and Ibex horns, the huge wild goats which still exist in the mountains above. The Kalash also have seasonal festivals including Chow Mas, which they believe to be the same festival as the Christian Christmas. They think that when they're finally pushed out by the neighbouring Muslims, they'll go to Germany or Britain. They say that Gish, their great war god, had apparently already migrated to London over a hundred years previously. I also visited the Lutko, a larger stream running down from the Afghan border some 40 miles north of Bombarat, and the only other significant trout water in Chitral. The trout here is said to have been introduced from Gilgit by a Scot in the early 60s, and they bred in huge numbers. A friend caught many while spinning from horseback, and Matsi Babu, fishing from Bomberet, had one of six pounds while fishing with a willow stick. <laughs>
By the time I visited there in 1973, the local people had discovered them and they were coming under pressure, although I managed to catch nine up to 15 inches in an afternoon. The Lutko is prone to damage from floods, and in 1995, when I fished there after a major flood with three visitors, we caught only one eight-inch fish. The Bomberet stream, in spite of the best efforts of Matsibabu, had also become effectively unfishable, thanks to catastrophic floods caused by the felling of the magnificent cedar forests, which in the 1970s still covered the adjoining mountains. The widespread popularity of trout even extended to the Kalash valleys where they probably accounted for a decline in the fish-eating taboo. My Kalash friend Abdul Khalik, being somewhat of an entrepreneur, even tried to start a small trout farm, but the idea never took off. He also tried to establish a chicken farm in a house he owned, but was voted down by the community council, who still felt strongly about the traditional taboo against eating birds. He then rented the house out to a group of Christians who'd come up to convert the pagan Kalash and turned it into a church. In the 1990s, I made several visits to Chitraw with fishing friends from the Glenkens and my nephew Tom. One of our aims was to help establish trout ponds in the villages, a venture in which we were, for various reasons, almost completely unsuccessful. It was also suggested that rainbow trout, which do better in fast water than browns, could be used for restocking the rivers, but local people objected to the introduction of this foreign fish. For them, the Scottish brown trout had by now become the Chitrali trout. We heard just recently that there was one village pond where brown trout had survived and later been washed out by yet another flood, establishing themselves in the nearby Lasper River, which runs down from the Shandua Pass on the Gilgit border. Not only that, but they were reaching huge weights, approaching 20 pounds, and had also run upstream to occupy a small loch where they now form a stable population from where they can restock the river naturally when trout are washed out by the inevitable floods. The Laspa River now joins the Lutko as the only sustainable trout water in the 200 mile long valley of Chitraw. Scottish trout were also introduced successfully into two larger rivers, the Utrot and Ushu, in the upper reaches of the Swat Valley southeast of Chitraw. When I first fished there in 1973, I took care to obtain a government permit, although this did not impress a local Pataan I met by the river, who made it clear that the trout belonged to his tribal community. I anyway cut a willow rod stick and caught 23 nice trout to over a pound behind boulders, although I couldn't reach the main stream where I knew much bigger trout were present. I had a similar catch when I returned there in 1976. My main fishing memory of those visits is the daily change in the river, which in the mornings ran low and clear, but in the afternoons became swollen and turbid due to snowmelt upstream. I've since been caught out by snowmelt and gilgit, and also here in the Glencairns by leaving live trout in handy, side, handy riverside puddles, only to find, when I returned an hour or two later, that the water had risen and they'd escaped into the river. I returned to the Utrot in June 1994 with a couple of friends and found that, as in Chitral, it had been heavily overfished and was not worth trying except perhaps in the distant upper reaches. However, we heard that in the neighbouring Ushu River there was still very good fishing in a slow section, some 20 miles upstream. So we took a jeep ride from Kalam up to Matiltan village and covered the last 12 miles on foot, a walk which took us up over 10,000 feet across some precipitous snowfields to the fishing grounds at Mahadon, the fish lake, an exotically beautiful area set about with great deodar cedars and fields of red primulas. I found a dead eagle owl among the trees there and later tied a trout fly from a wing feather, a large version of the old Scottish hoolip fly, which imitates a moth. It's still in my fly box, waiting for the right evening to try it out. We started catching trout immediately on flies and spinners, although we had to take regular sleep breaks in our tents due to fits of nausea caused by coming up too fast from the lowlands. The fish were not particularly large, up to a pound or so, but we caught plenty in spite of the water being of mere 5 degrees centigrade, far below a normal feeding temperature. Their food, though, was clearly abundant, with enormous rafts of coronamid flies circling in the eddies. I later learnt that coronamid larvae can thrive in glaciers up to 12 degrees below zero, colder than anything in Antarctica, by living off the layers of organic pollution which rise up from the subcontinent below. We didn't catch any big fish, but were interested to learn from our guide Mohammed that there were trout in a small, nameless and equally remote loch in Gilgit, about 30 miles north of Mahadon. He had walked up there a few weeks before, 
The problem for us was that the trek to the loch involved climbing a 16,000 foot snowbound pass, which we were in no fit state to do. So we decided to take the 200 mile scenic route, which involved a walk back down to Matiltan, a jeep to Kalam, tribal buses southwest down the main Swat Valley, north into Deer State, up over the 10,000 foot Lawari Pass into Chitraw, and then south again over the 12,000 foot Shando Pass into Gilgit. The final leg consisted of an eight mile walk up a small uninhabited tributary of the upper Giza River, a shallow oxbow of a few acres connected to the tributary. Gilgit was well worth the six day journey. As we approached the water we saw a group of nice trout chasing tadpoles in the gin clear margins and immediately put up our fly rods. I attached a black panel and cast to the nearest fish. The fly sunk behind it, but the trout spotted it, turned around, sucked it off the bottom, and made a 40 yard dash across the loch. It weighed nearly three pounds and was in excellent condition. We soon discovered that the trout here were not only large, averaging two pounds, but very numerous. After a couple of days, our trout diet, however delicious, became a little repetitive. We were relieved when an old man arrived together with a lad carrying a small live sheep across his shoulders. These small mountain sheep are very tasty and we were happy to join them in a dinner of lamb kebabs. The old man was a prince from Lower Gilgit who had fished here many times. The largest trout he knew of was caught by his father from the small inflowing river and weighed 26 pounds. The nearest we came to catching a really big one was where one of our party, spinning in the river, had a double figure trout follow his bait into the bank. Tom caught a four pounder, the biggest we saw in the loch that year. The reason why trout grow so big here is something of a mystery. We saw no sign of small forage fish, the stomachs contained only invertebrates, tadpoles, and one large freshwater shrimp, the so-called Tibetan shrimp, which is apparently the basis for seafood restaurants in Tibet. It appeared that the trout here fed mainly on invertebrates, which, like the rivers of Swat, were very numerous. Another feature of the trout was that since their arrival, probably less than a hundred years before, they had separated into two types, a silver one like a sea trout and one with normal brown trout coloration. The same phenomenon can be seen among trout in many Scottish lochs, including Glenken's ones like Earlston and Cars Fad, where the trout have become isolated since the hydro dams were built over a century ago. In Loch Doon there are also two similar types which have been there for millennia and are probably quite distinct genetically. Trout samples from the Gilgit Loch were examined by my friend Andy Ferguson, Professor of Genetics at the Queen's University in Belfast, who found that the original fish introduced to the subcontinent in the 1800s were not in fact Loch Lieben trout, as stated in the textbooks, but, was, but were descended from the standard Howie II in fish farm stock, consisting of mixes of Scottish East Coast and West Coast races. My favourite fishing spot was the huge boulder from which Mohammed caught his 16-pounder, and from there I could watch dozens of trout lying still in the shallows. They didn't respond to my lure until about 3pm each day when they suddenly all became active together and I had a hit almost every cast. The kind of behaviour which confirmed what I already suspected, that loch trout have regular meal times when they'll begin feeding in unison without the stimulus of a fly hatch. When four of us went up in September the following year, we hired three donkeys to carry our bags and food for several days. But the donkeys turned out to be geriatrics and couldn't even manage walking pace, so we ended up carrying most of the gear ourselves. We also took a paraffin stove to avoid using the depleted birchwood coppices, which are the main fuel source for the nearest village, eight miles downstream. This time the trout were finishing their breakfast by 7am and didn't seriously come on to feed again until 5pm. We fished the evening rise for an hour or two each day and took 40 trout, averaging a pound and a half, smaller than the previous year, possibly because of interchanges in the population from the river or from a small natural loch in which was full of wee ones and looked like an ideal nursery. The wildlife at the Gilgit Loch were as interesting as the trout. The previous year the old prince had pointed out flocks of marchor and ibex goats grazing on the slopes of the 16,000 foot mountain above us and there were many species of birds. On the way up, we'd watched a family of saka falcons catching dragonflies by a roadside pool. And at the loch itself, there were flocks of migratory birds resting up on their autumn flight from Siberia to the subcontinent. Our driver Latif, who'd brought a shotgun up with him, had already bagged three species of dove outside villages on our way up through Chitraw.
and at the loch itself he got a stint, a pretty wading bird I recognised only from bird guides. He also shot a heron, a rare and almost mythological bird in North Pakistan. The Chitrali word for heron translates as top chicken, and he said he'd be a hero in his village when he took it home. He intended to eat it, but I imagine he would have needed a lot of chilli to disguise its flavour. While we headed for Chitral, Tom and his friend explored the upper reaches of the main Gizar River, which rises out of Kokush, a large and reputedly fishlish loch not far from the Shandu Pass, which looked like it had only quite recently formed below the glacier at its head. They camped and used a dinghy to explore it, but failed to catch or see signs of a fish. Kokush is probably the largest of the few lochs in northern Pakistan, and the following year I decided to try and bring some trout up from the Khizar River and up over the bouldery porous moraine which was preventing them from accessing it. I reached the Shando Pass in late September and spent the night in a big tent with a group of Pathan tribals who'd spent the summer trying to catch peregrine falcons. They had with them a captive peregrine which they were using to attract wild ones, but without success. Patan said that they'd previously been to neighbouring China where there were plenty of peregrines but where they not only had to pay large bribes to the police but were unable to make any friends. I said that they should come to my country where there was also plenty of peregrines but they somehow knew that that would be impossible. I imagined the local outrage when a group of Taliban types were caught poaching peregrines in the highlands. The RSPB would ask for the death sentence. The main entertainment that evening was peregrine feeding time, when everyone retired to their sleeping bags to watch with rapt attention the magnificent captive bird devouring its dinner. The next morning I set off for Hokush, across a gravel plain dotted with clumps of wild roses, miniature honeysuckle and wild blackcurrant bushes. The only notable creature I met on the way was a large and impassive buoyak. There were no pools as such on the river, only a continuous stony cataract filled with very small trout, which had eroded fins from being battered against the stones, making them look like fish farm trout. I camped below the moraine that evening and constructed a holding device using a piece of netting wrapped round a frame of willow branches. The camp was absolute luxury. I'd fill my teapot with water at night, so that in the morning I could reach out from my bivouac and grab a handful of bark from an aptly named paper birch, lay it in the fireplace with some twigs, and put the teapot on, while I said good morning to the friendly seven-inch trout which lived in a tiny clear backwater six feet away, all without getting out of my sleeping bag. Next day I fished hard and got 21 trout, including a 12-inch monster which I had for dinner. I have a clear memory of a small trout dashing through a big green standing wave after my beadhead fly. The following morning I put 17 in a plastic jerry can with just enough water to cover their backs and carried them up the moraine to the loch. I knew that if I kept moving the water would stay well oxygenated. One glance into the loch and I knew immediately that there were no fish in it. The bed was thickly covered in caddis and mayfly larva, while red and brown coronamid worms hung suspended in the freezing water. If the trout succeeded in breeding here, this invertebrate zoo would be decimated. I let loch water slowly into the jerry can to let the fish acclimatise to the temperature before they slowly swam out, right side up, and sat quietly on the bottom to recover from their rough journey, before swimming slowly and steadily off into the depths. The following morning it was snowing gently, and the snow line, which had crept lower down the mountains every day, had almost reached the valley floor. I had no warm clothes, so decided to head back, stopping only to catch 17 more trout to add to the dozen I'd had the evening before, enough for a meal for my town friends who were beginning to worry about me, as I'd only planned to be away for two days. They'd been trying unsuccessfully to catch trout on a heavy hand line and big hook, so next day I left them with some light line and a few trout flies, with which they were most impressed with. I returned to Chokhush five years later, in mid-May 2001, with a party of six, including three from the Glenkens and three Afghan friends. We camped near the Peregrine Hunters site and caught around 60 very small trout for dinner. We deep-fried them, but at that elevation they seemed to take forever to brown. 
a pan of potatoes took over an hour before it even thought about boiling. Up at the Hokush there was still snow lying under the birches and a hard freezing wind, the sort of conditions I would not have expected to catch trout in Scotland, and sure enough we fished for a few hours without a sign of a fish, so I still didn't know if any of the seventeen trout had survived to find a suitable burn in which to spawn and reproduce. The answer came several years later when I bought a fishing magazine in Castle Douglas and saw an article by a British fisherman who had gone up to Hochush with a Pakistani tourist guide and made a huge catch of good-sized trout. The area around Shandu has now been turned into a national park and I imagine the trout are an important attraction. It seems that the efforts of our small group of Glen Ken's fishers finally led to the establishment of two important new and sustainable wild Scottish brown trout fisheries in northern Pakistan.